good morning <clears throat> good morning to everyone welcome to church uh, this morning we are over the next couple of weeks we're changing just slightly some of the order of things that we are uh, doing uh, in our announcements and stuff just some slight tweaks which is why uh, the worship team is already up here uh, part of that is to uh, go through announcements a little faster, which I've already ruined um, <laughs> by talking. But we're just going to uh, approach announcements more in a, uh, this is what is happening uh, in the next four-ish weeks here at Southland. This happens to be today a long list because over the next four weeks, we're going to be starting a lot of things. Uh, so I just kind of want to go over some of them. Uh, Operation Christmas Child is having their crafting party, uh, and I believe that's uh, tomorrow uh, here at the church. Uh, on the 4th of September, youth group starts. On the 5th, Awana starts. Uh, and if you were kind of holding out to be the hero for Awana, I know they're ready uh, for some small group leaders. Uh, so it's your time to come in as the hero. Uh, on the 6th, uh, September, there's going to be a fellowship dinner and uh, prayer time uh, here at the church. Uh, just kind of a, a potluck thing. Um, on the 7th, in the morning, uh, will be men's breakfast will start. I think there's a sign-up sheet out here for that. On the uh, 11th, yes, on the 11th, ladies' Bible study is going to start. There's a sign-up and some information if you would like to be a part of that. Uh, out on the sign-up board. On, also on the 11th in the evening rather than the morning, our midweek study will pick up and we will start our Wednesday nights. And then on the following week on the 17th, the Ladies Book Club will also start meeting. So that gives us everything that's kind of going on uh, through the next several weeks. It's quite a bit. So hopefully you've got a picture of that or you know to at least visit the sign-up board and get yourself signed up. We look forward to that. Casey? If you guys have any questions about the announcements that we just had, you can talk to me and I can point you to Nathan and you can get that all <laughs> squared away. <laughs> I'm super excited. Uh, we're starting in the book of John today and I have been eagerly anticipating this just as much, if not more, than the finale of Job that you guys heard all about um, months ago. Was it months ago? It doesn't matter. It was a while ago. At any rate, uh, we're just going to... We're just going to dive right in and start praising Jesus for who he is. Um, I love that Richie's uh, Sunday school class dovetailed into knowing who Jesus is and knowing the facts about Jesus um, straight into John. This is going to be a great series, and I'm glad you guys are here to join us with it. So please stand. I'm going to pray, and we're going to start with Jesus Messiah. Father, I just thank you for the opportunity to, to be inside these walls. God, with, with my family with your family, uh, the church. Lord, I pray for each one of us as we begin to praise you for who you are, as we seeing out your truths um, at the top of our lungs. Lord, as we contemplate what you're doing in our lives individually and collectively as a local body of believers, God, that anything that gets accomplished this morning that has any sort of value at all, God, that we know where it comes from, that it be straight from you, um, that you do the guiding, that you do the leading, that you do the directing, and that you be the motivation behind our voices as we cry out to you in a song. You are the name above all names. And there is no other way in which we can come to know you than through Jesus Christ. And we honor you this morning, and we thank you as we praise you in Jesus' name. I pray these things. Amen. He became sin, who knew no sin, that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross, love so amazing, love so Messiah, name 
name above all names. Blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sin. from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. His body the bread, His blood the wine, broken and
It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. You only. collect our offering at this time, Lord, I pray as always that uh, whatever amount you've laid on our hearts to give to you this morning, God, that it be out of joy, that it be out of gratitude, that it be a form of worship, that it be a form of praise, God, and that you bless it, that you use it, that we could be your hands and feet, that we wouldn't just be examples of who you are, but that we would be microphones of the truth that is found in you and you alone saving grace that comes through knowing Christ and that we could see the lives of the people we come in contact with shaped and changed and molded by their creator we thank you for this opportunity in Jesus name amen Amen. beginning one with God the Lord most high your hidden glory in creation now revealed in you our Christ what a beautiful name it is what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. We didn't want heaven without us. Jesus, you brought heaven down. My 
sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. And nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name. Of Jesus, what a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you, silence the bowls of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring. The praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no equal, now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory. challenges us in his Sunday school time um, to share um, wh what God has taught you this week. And for me, that no matter what kind of chaos is on my plate, no matter what timelines and deadlines are at my feet, there is nothing that is that God doesn't want to hear about. Even the smallest struggles that we go through, God wants to be involved the mundane things that don't seem to have any effect on life at all. God wants to know about it. He wants to be involved in it. He wants you to come to him in everything, from the breath that fills our lungs to the upset customers because their cars are broken. God wants to be a part of it all so that he can show each one of us how great and mighty he really is and so that we can be affirmed that there is only one true God and church, we're serving him. So stand with us as we finish up the set this morning. One voice in the dark, a song that lights up the stars. There's one breath that gives life. One sovereign in power who speaks with thunder and fire. There's one Lord, one King. There is no other that can compare to you. Because you are the one. Who raised for it? 
there's one name, there's one word, one way to be saved, one lamb that was slain. Except for the children, you are dismissed to Children's Church as we make our transition. And for those of us who in the long way, for those of us who remain, we are going to pray. Lord, we uh, come before you with thankfulness, Lord, with joy as we get to open your word, as we get to share together. Lord, we thank you for being a God who is full of care, a God who is full of mercy, kindness. Lord, as we do begin this study in John, we thank you, Lord, that you're a God who is gracious, has never left us to flounder and to be alone but a God who has always been near and even comes near in our times of need. Lord, we pray uh, for us this morning as we're, we're together, we're in worship and in study. We pray for those who are not able to be here, whether it's illness, whether it's some other uh, situation or condition which has kept them from uh, participating with your body this morning. Pray that you would build up, that you would nourish. Lord, we pray for a world, a world that is finding itself ever in darkness, but a world that has hope because of your son, Jesus, and the light that he brings. Lord, as we really come now to your word, change us from the inside that we would apprehend your light more clearly, that we would reflect it more purely. 
to this world around us. It's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Every story that we share, virtually every story we share, has a main character. The main character is important to the story if we were taking a writing class because it's the main character uh, that is going to be the central thing when progress happens, when the story takes place. So we have a Little Red Riding Hood, or we have Bilbo Baggins, or we have whomever uh, you're reading, and you have this main character, and they're on some kind of journey. Now, in those cases, it was an actual journey uh, where they were traveling through something, but it may be just a figurative kind of journey the main character is going through. And the writer is using the main character because all the events in the story progress in a certain way in connection to whomever that main character happens to be. The main character is really important. And it's not just in fiction that we have main characters. We could have a biography in which we're telling a real story about a real person, and that person is the main character. And it's not just in books that we would do this, but you do this all the time. At least I know I do. I will go home and I will say to my wife, you will not believe what happened to me today because I am the main character. Oh, I was driving and this is what I saw. The main character is important to us. It becomes really crucial to how we communicate anything. We want to have something central. It's foundational to this communication, especially when we're telling a true story, a real thing, that we're giving a context. This is who it's about. This is the main character of the story. So it's really no wonder that when we get to the Gospel of John, and we're going to open it up and start at the beginning of the Gospel in chapter 1, at verse 1, that we find that John, as he's writing his Gospel, he's going to come into this idea of the main character. In fact, if we look at John chapter 1, just in that first chapter, the first 18 verses of John uh, are, they're not part of the, the story that he's going to communicate. They're a prologue. He wants to give us a little bit of an introduction to what he wants to write about. And these first 18 verses are magnificent. These are some of my most favorite verses in Scripture. They're beautiful. From a, a literary standpoint, they're just wonderful. And I love them. I love reading through them. I love reading what John is writing. I mean, if it's not actually poetry, it... it borders on the poetic here. And it gets me excited in these verses. And so we're going to take time. We're not going to go through all 18 this week. I have way too much to say uh, to get through all 18. We're just going to pick off the first five. Looking at John's prologue, looking at John's introduction, and right away, as you read these first 18 verses, you can see that the introduction that John has makes his gospel very different than the others. Matthew, Mark, Luke, we call them the synoptic gospels. It means to uh, see together. Because they all kind of have the same sound. They're all dealing with the same general kinds of themes. They cover a lot of the same stories. And they kind of just give us, you know, a little synopses. They go from here to here to here in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John is going to write something different. Now, it's not that he is writing a different story. He's still telling the story of Jesus, a real story about a real person, and he wants to communicate that. But he's going to highlight some different parts of what took place. He knows what those guys wrote. He wants to you know, write his own thing. He's going to spend more time on fewer stories because John has a different purpose, and this is what he's bringing out in this introduction. Matthew, Mark, and Luke these synoptics, they want us to understand everything that was going on through the lens of the main character. 
And the main character for Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the main character is Jesus. John does not want us to understand. I mean, he wants us to understand, but he's not focused on the historical events and the context through the lens of the main character. John wants you to know the main character. That's his concern. That we would know Jesus. Because for John, Jesus is the main character. Now, that's true. If we just read through the Gospel of John, it's very clear. Jesus is the central figure, the one we're going to talk about the most, the one we're concerned about the one, uh, the most, the one who's doing all this stuff. John's the main character, uh, or Jesus is the main character, rather, for John. But I think it's even bigger than that, because I think in John's life, Jesus is the main character. And that comes out in his writing. John doesn't talk about himself as he's going through uh, the Gospels. He writes about what Jesus did. He doesn't reference himself. He'll talk about himself uh, you know, in an oblique sort of way. Maybe he refers to himself as this is the disciple Jesus loved or you know, the other disciple something. He comes up with a way of talking about himself, but he doesn't insert his name there. And it would have been the perfect time. But John doesn't do that because he's not the main character. He doesn't want us as the reader to get caught up with, oh, here was John, and here's why he's writing this. John wants us to focus fully on Jesus because he wants us to know who Jesus is because for John in his life, Jesus is the main character. And even more as we go through these first five verses, we find that Jesus is not just the main character of this book. Jesus is not just the main character in John's life. Jesus is the main character in the universe. He is the main character. And John wants us to know him. Let's read John chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. John wants us to know the main character. But why is it important? Why, why would we want to know this main character? Why is Jesus the main character and worth writing this book about? Why is Jesus the main character of John's life? Why is Jesus the main character of the universe? Well, in just these few verses, we have three identities of Jesus. John identifies him in three different ways that show us why Jesus is the main character. The first of those is that Jesus is the expression of, of God. In the first two verses there, if we just go back and review, in the beginning, oh, just got to tell you, I love these verses. Now, a year ago, I preached through the book of Galatians, and I gave you a challenge to memorize verses, and I'm not doing that for the book of John, though we would have more time, and there's so many good verses. I just, I'm going to have other projects for you. We'll get to that in a moment. But if you were a memorizing person, this is so good. Memorize this. Know this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Now let's talk about that a little bit. The identity, when I say that Jesus is the expression of God, that identity is wrapped up in a word, uh, a Greek word, which we translate as Word, and that word is uh, logos. Now we're probably familiar with it. We've probably heard it in part because this is such a, a an important, pivotal, essential verse and doctrine to the church, and has been for Christianity from its very beginning. And so we've all heard about logos and uh, that kind of thing. It just means word. And John is writing about the word. Now, it's an important word, logos, and it was important at the time and in the culture. And there were a lot of reasons that it was important. For the Greeks, remember, uh, 
if you have forgotten this about history, uh, where we're at, the Romans have kind of control of everything, but the Romans were not necessarily the most creative of people. And so the Greeks had conquered everything before them, and they Hellenized everyone. So everyone kind of spoke Greek because of the work the Greeks did. And when the Romans took over everything, they said, oh, that's very convenient for us. Let's keep that going. And so everyone speaks this. But the Greeks had had a whole culture and history where they had been so focused on different pursuits of philosophy. And the word logos is really important to that uh, because it's philosophy, rhetoric, uh, argument, logic, all these things uh, were coming together and that's coming out of the Greek culture. And so it had this idea of just communicating truth. I'm going to put something together. I want you to believe it. I want you to know it. This is my word. This is a, a, an argument or a bit of philosophy I have, the word that I'm going to give to you. So John's kind of picking up for all of the Greek world out there this idea, and he's bringing it over, but it doesn't end there. And in fact, I don't even think that's John's main target. It's kind of just serendipity that it's going to work out that way. There's something else going on here. Because John is a, a Jew, an Israelite, and he's going to share some background there. And so he is using this uh, word, logos, with this Jewish context as well. Now, it still means the same thing, word. But when they were thinking about it, especially when you're talking about God, you're going back to the Old Testament, and you're thinking about all the things God has promised. This was a word of God. All the things that God had used his prophets to prophesy. You're thinking about the things that God has done, and that is all related to his word. But John wants us to think about, I think, something very specific. And it's in this verse. He starts out this verse in the beginning. Does that make you think of another verse? At the beginning of something? Maybe the whole thing? So if we were to go back to Genesis chapter 1, we would read a similar kind of thing. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, John wants us thinking about the beginning. Because if we go back to Genesis and we go, oh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Do you know, remember from Genesis 1 how he did that? How did God create light? God spoke, God said, you know, God told light to be however we word it. God said, let there be light, and there was light. But have you ever thought about what it meant for God to speak? We're going to do a little bit of science and kinds of stuff today. Uh, but when you speak... Uh, what's happening is there's little things in there shaking in a particular kind of way to make all the vocalizations, right? And it shakes the air, and it goes out into your, your ear, shakes a little hammer on a drum. That's, hey. I took biology sometimes. <laughs> right, so all this stuff happens. But when God speaks in the beginning, there is no air. There is no sound. Because there's no created thing. Nothing has been created. God is creating it then. And so if there is no thing which has been created, the only thing which there is, is God. And so John is going back into that moment and says when God spoke, when God issued a word, the word which he is issuing is not just what you and I think in terms of sound and this kind of thing. That word must be God because that's all that was. So when God spoke this word which was God was there. And it's that word which was communicating out what God wanted to communicate. The word of God then is this creative expression. It is power and it is God. Now Jesus uh, is not named here. John is not going to use the name of Jesus for a while, but we see him. And if we were to read down just a little bit, we would see that this is who John is writing about. He's writing to us about Jesus. Jesus is the main character. But he's kind of 
rolling things back a little bit before uh, he was known as Jesus, and he says, here, there was the word. Think about it this way. If I were to ask you, who are you? How would you answer that question? Now, you don't need to do it out loud. You can do it in your head. You say, I would say, who are you? And you would say, I am, you know, John, Dave, uh, whatever uh, your name is. I picked guys because I'm a guy and that it made it easy. But, you know, Nathan, I'm Nathan. That's what we would say. But what if you didn't have a name? And it got me thinking, and I did a little research over the last couple of weeks, and I looked up, how long could you go without a name? I could win awards for, like, rare internet searches, maybe. <laughs> so I was wondering, how long could you go without a name? Turns out, in some states, a, a child which is born could go up to a year without a name. Now, that, I'm not saying that that happens. I'm just saying legally they could, they could go for a year. I don't know if you have gone a year and you haven't named your child, like what's going to motivate you on day 366, but apparently the state says, no, now, uh, you know, we just pick one randomly or something. But if you went a year without a name, who would you be? <laughs> no name. It's possible. It's a town in Colorado because they couldn't think of a name. Who would you be? You know, for a while, it is true that you existed without a name. And for us, as we're reading through John, that's kind of what's going on here. Jesus it exists, but he, he wasn't known as Jesus yet. And so John's rolling things back. Well, this is the word. This is the word. So what do we know about the word? We know that he was there in the beginning. That is, he was preexistent with God. Uh, when the beginning started, he was already there with God. We know from what it says that he was with God, so he coexists with God. And when John says that the word was with God, this is kind of a, a peculiar word uh, that gets translated with uh, in this sense. It's a more of a relational idea. So if you were to open my pantry, you might find that I keep the peanut butter with the jelly in the pantry before the jelly is opened. So uh, they're spatially together. And a lot of times when we say with, that's what we mean. It's a spatial relationship, the peanut butter with the jelly. But if I'm eating them, it's not spatial. I like my peanut butter with jelly. It's relational. It's not just that I want them near each other. I want them. <laughs> so that's the idea that John is communicating here. In the beginning was the word. He existed, and he was with God relationally. They were together. He was with God. They coexisted. And he closes that first verse with, he was, the word was God. So he not only coexists with God, he is also self-existent. He is God. That's what we know about the word. Jesus is the complete and perfect expression of God. If you want to know God, then you must know Jesus. He is the expression of God. The power, the creative power of God is Jesus. He is the expression of God. He should be the main character because he is God. From the beginning, even now, self-existent, he is God. And he should be the main character. Well, he turns from that, John does as he's writing, he says this is what is true, and he takes us into the next thing, which is Jesus, uh, he's the expression of God, but Jesus is also the <clears throat> essence of God. Verses three and four. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. Now John is taking us back 
still thinking about Genesis 1, about things in the beginning. In fact, we're going to see as we go through the gospel for quite a ways, uh, John is wanting us to kind of carry through some of these ideas, to see the wholeness, the connection of who Jesus is. So he goes back into Genesis, and what was going on? God was creating everything. And God did that through his word, through the word of God, through Jesus. Jesus is integral to creation. But what I want to specifically highlight here is this issue of life. Because Jesus creates everything. It's an issue of life, of existence, like life in the broadest sense of things. Here it exists. John's not the only one to see this connection. Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, Paul's talking about other things, but he says, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. So uh, he, Paul makes the same connection that Jesus is the creator. He's imbuing things with life. And John is pointing us deeper uh, than just this issue of existence. When he's talking about life, he's talking about a principle of life in kind of this broad term uh, of existence, but more that this is the, the function of life. This is something which God has invested in his creation. Now, as I said, if we get a little more science-y, let's break it down a little bit and think about this. I, as a person, I'm a collection of all sorts of organs, and they're all doing their things moderately well most of the time, and you know, so I'm living. But if I broke those down, well, I'm actually a collection of cells, and they're, they're uh, they better be doing all their things. I assume that they are. We don't talk much, my cells and I. Uh, but they're all there doing stuff. But I could break it down further, and I could go all the way into like an atomic level of things. I'm a whole uh, bunch of atoms. But if you start thinking about it that way, it gets really weird because I'm a bunch of atoms, but right here in front of me is a bunch of other atoms. And so what differentiates these atoms from those atoms? There's something particular in what God has created. And even if we go down and we think about atoms, atoms got all these things moving and spinning and doing all that stuff. Where does the energy come from? Where's the movement from? There is something peculiar about life. And that peculiarity, that life, that existence comes from God. Specifically, John is telling us it comes from Jesus. He is the life. He's communicating this life to us. In him, he says, was life. We are imbued with this from God. If we go back to Genesis, when God creates man and he breathes into him, he, he produces in Adam life. And John is highlighting that same thing here. There is life in Jesus. It's the essence, some essence of God. He is, he is contributing to his creation because he's not just creating Legos. He's not just making me a pile of stuff. He has made me a living thing. And so God has shared in his essence in this way, and Jesus is reflecting that. Now, for study, I'm not going to make you memorize things, but I am going to recommend something. And it's really, here's you start in this verse. Verse 3, if you're a highlighter, I am not really much of a highlighter. Uh, it took me a long time. My wife loves to highlight things. And I was like, the first time I saw her doing it, we were dating. I didn't even know if we were dating yet, but I overcame this issue. Uh, but I, I saw her, she was reading a book for school, and she got out a highlighter, and she went like this in the book, and I went, <gasps> what are you, you know, that was a book, and you just, you marked it. 
And she said, that way I can look back at it and see all the important things. Oh, good. I've overcome it some. If you are a highlighter, I want to recommend something to you. If you're not a highlighter, mentally highlight this. Every time in the Gospel of John, you run across some words, highlight them. Life and light. There are two others, love, so it's all L words, right? Life, light, love, and truth. Truth sticks out because it's not an L word. Uh, but still, pay attention to those. These are important words to John because they're connected to God. And we're going to talk about light in a moment, but we see it with life. Life extends from God. It is part of his essence, part of his nature. It's the self-existent one, the one who depends on no one else for his existence. He is life. And so when he creates, and he wants to create something which is living, he's imbuing something of what he is into the thing he has created. So pay attention to that. John says then of Jesus, he is our life. It should hold our attention. He should be the main character because this is where life comes from. Now, when I was a young person, uh, we had a telephone in my house that had a cord. Uh, there is still one. Some of you have no idea of maybe what I'm talking about. I mean, you've seen them, right, in pictures. And if you don't believe that this is the way it was in our kitchen in the church, we actually have a telephone that still has a cord. And the thing with that was you could only get so far away. And I remember our first cordless phone. It was a marvel. It had like the telescoping antenna. It was a little bit more sizable than the other phones, but you could walk anywhere in the house. But you couldn't get very far. Because you had to stay close. Because even though it seemed like it was cordless, it still had to connect to its source. Well, now cell phones. Cell phones have changed the game entirely. I can be virtually anywhere except in my house. <laughs> There's, I know you all laughed and you think, oh, he's saying such a funny thing. No, this is a serious issue in our house. <laughs> There's a good half of the house. We could duct tape a line in our house where past this point, the phone is probably not going to work. And it hasn't just been here. We just have this luck with houses. I had the same thing in Las, Ve in Las Vegas when we lived there. There was one room in the house our cell phone would work in. It happened to be the master bathroom. And so anytime <laughs> I needed to take a serious phone call, I was always sitting on the edge of the bathtub. And I remember being online with customer service and saying, this is a problem. And they said, well, you know, where are you right now? You know, are you hearing me fine? I said, I am, because I'm sitting in the bathtub. <laughs> this, is, this is the only place it works, and this isn't right. So we know, I'm sure you've been in places where suddenly you lose service. You know what it's like when you're, you've lost the source. Jesus should be the main character because all this life, all this existence, all this purpose is coming from him. And so we got to hold him as the main character of things because this is where life is. This is where the source is. And if we move too far off, we get disconnected from that. We need his essence. Jesus is the expression of God. He is the essence of God. And thirdly, and lastly, he is the effulgence of God. Now, effulgence is a really uh, cool word. It always reminds me of coffee. Uh, but it has nothing to do with coffee, in my opinion. It just means radiance, brilliance. It's the shining light. It's effulgent. So if you didn't know that this morning, now I have added to your day. And uh, you can go find things which are effulgent and share them with one another. And say, look, look at that effulgent headlamp you know, on that car. I can't take it. <laughs> but Jesus is the effulgence of God. He is the shining radiance of who God is. 
if we pick up just the last verse, uh, I mean, in verse 4, he said that life was the light of men. In verse 5, he says, the light shines in the darkness. The darkness has not overcome it. Now, when John is talking about light, what we will see is we're reading through the gospel and you're highlighting or at least taking note of this is when light comes up. What you'll see is that John is talking about uh, this kind of revelation where God is making something known, but it's specific uh, kinds of things he's making known. He's making known his glory, which is light. He's making known his, his revelation. He's making known salvation because he's dealing with a world that is in darkness. And the solution and the hope and the need of a world that is in darkness is light. And so that's what John is talking about. That we would see the glory of God, the righteousness of God, that we might comprehend what is the righteousness and glory of God and understand we need that. Again, Paul says something very similar. This is in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. He says, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, remember Genesis 1, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And John is saying the same thing. Remember Genesis 1, in the beginning, when the Word was there, and when God was creating things, and He created light, that light becomes this representation, the real light of men, according to John. The light of men is Jesus Christ. Everything in light is about what is being like given to us. So there's a relevant lack here. Uh, and it, you can see very clearly the word light. You know if there's light, there's probably darkness. Don't highlight the words darkness because I don't want you to highlight darkness in your Bible. What a sad uh, dark kind of thing. But highlight light, take note of darkness because they're in contrast. Where we are in darkness, it speaks of our lack and our need of things. It's a commentary on our situation now. Oh, we might look at the world and say, this world is, is dealing with darkness. And that's probably true. But we could look here in our own lives and see that there is darkness because there are things I am lacking. There is truth I do not have. There is hope I, I am missing out on. There is glory and righteousness which I do not possess. We're in a place of darkness and we need light. I need God to show me who he is that I might know him more and more and more and that that darkness might be pushed back further and further and further. And that's a good thing because this is what John is talking about. That light answers our need. Where we might be in a place of oppressing truth, a place where we are removing ourselves from glory, a place where our evil, our sin is a problem because it's incongruent with creation. Remember, it's God that created. It's man that has brought in this sin and corrupted uh, this creation that God has made. But that creation, that life was light. What are we bringing in with this darkness? We bring in death. We bring in wrongdoing. We bring in unrighteousness when we need the righteousness of God. And John says that this light shines in the darkness. This is his, the, the present tense. You want to know why Jesus should be the main character? Well, he, he is the expression of God, and we could remember back how he expressed God as a word. He, he has been the effulgence of God because he was the radiance of God, or the uh, essence of God because he was God creating things. But he is, he is the effulgence. Even now, right now, Jesus is shining out on the world, shining out in grace, shining out in truth, shining out in hope in the world and in our lives, in our hearts. 
Jesus should be the main character because he is shining out. And John says the darkness will not overcome. Will not I sometimes comprehend. The idea is that uh, the darkness is not going to be able to bring this into sway, uh, into control. The sense of it is this, and it's a weird illustration, and if you think it's weird, uh, that's okay. It, it may be. But when I was a little kid, anyone drink out of a, the water hose? Because it tasted better, right? Now, normal Normal kids would, you know, you hold the hose and you just, you kind of get your mouth in there like a fountain. <laughs> but brothers sometimes have a different approach. And that is, you put your mouth on the hose. <laughs> and then you give a thumbs up to the other brother, who is no brighter than you are. <laughs> and he unkinks that thing. You're not going to be able to contain all the water that's coming. It's a very bad idea. <laughs> that's the idea here. The, uh, the, the word literally kind of has the idea of like you can't take it down. So this darkness is, is raising up against the light, but the light is so strong, so powerful, so overwhelming that the dark will not overcome it. And that's good news for us. Jesus is the main character. He is going to be the main character as John is writing. That's what John wants us to write about. But this tells us why. Why would John pick to write about Jesus? Because he is the expression of God. He is the word of God. John would write about Jesus because he is the essence of God. This is where creation, this is where life comes from. It's from this one. Why would I write about anything else? Why would anything else be more important? John is writing about Jesus because Jesus is shining in the darkness. And Jesus is not merely shining in the darkness. Jesus is shining in our darkness. And our darkness will not overcome it. And in this situation, if you do not overcome, you become overwhelmed. We are overwhelmed by the light of Jesus. This is why he is the main character, but not just for John. Jesus ought to be the main character for all of us. And as we go through the book, that's what we want Jesus to be the main character, that we would know him. Now right now, this morning, I don't know how long you've been in a relationship with Jesus Christ. It may be that you have not yet trusted in Jesus Christ. That opportunity is here. As we're going to read uh, from the Gospel of John, we will read about this one, Jesus, who is the Word, who comes to us in our darkness, who dies on a cross as a sacrifice for our sin, who is raised up on the third day, that if we trust in Him, we find salvation. And that's available to you if you've never trusted in Jesus Christ. It may be that you have trusted in Jesus Christ. Perhaps you've been walking with Him for 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. But I can tell you, regardless of which situation you're in or where you're at on that spectrum, I know your greatest need, and that is your greatest need, is to know Jesus Christ more and more and more. And that's where John is going to take us because Jesus is, in fact, the main character. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for uh, your word and your grace to us. Father, I, I know here this morning, as we're thinking about that, the truth is that we experience your grace in such wonderful ways. We could not earn our salvation. We could not overcome the darkness. Lord, we, we are part of the darkness. We needed you. 
We needed you and your son to come to us, to shed light on us. And if I may, Lord, just give a moment to anyone here who has not trusted in your son to be their savior. To let this be the time in which they look to you, in which they uh, trust in your son, which they put faith in Jesus. Here is the word of God who has come to them, who has died for them. They need only to believe. But Father, for all of us, use your word even this week that we would see more clearly. Use one another uh, in this week that we would know more clearly your son, Jesus Christ. That he would be the main character of our hearts even as he is the main character of the universe. It's in his name that we would come to you in prayer. In the name of Jesus, amen. Please, please stand with us as we uh, dismiss with holy and anointed. afternoon church you are dismissed have a wonderful week